Well, I tell you plain and straight right now. Nothing of the kind. I meant no harm. I don't want anything but you in my home. But if you're going to be so good and so perfect and so unforgiving that I can't have that, then I thank heaven I found there is something else. Something that makes you so dizzy you don't know what's happening, you don't care. Now you go ahead and believe anything you like. Marriage would no longer be a partnership of unequals. I don't want to be like my mother, a yes woman for some man. I want to be a if a couple chose to get married at all. I don't want to be a wife. If women are going to have affairs with men, and apparently, sociologically, there was a huge rise in the number of women who were not virgins when they married. So this was a real thing. Women really were having sex without marriage, without benefit of wedlock. And you suddenly have a huge number of unwed mothers. Rising star young Claudette Colbert plays an unwed mother in Torch Singer. She starts as a sort of anti-role model when she gives her baby up for adoption. Don't ever let any man make a sucker out of you. Only to drown herself in a life of careless frivolity. I'm as free as a bird on the wing. Splendid. She eventually becomes a cynical radio star who broadcasts a children's show from her Manhattan apartment. Naughty boys have often tried to tease your Aunt Jenny. Sometimes they've teased her till she had to give in. But she won't this afternoon. And do you know why? Because Aunt Jenny has a dish of lovely old Tina in her hands. I want you all to try it. You'll be surprised how it'll make you grow. Torch Singer possessed an irreverence that seemed destined to rile the censors. Hello, Aunt Jenny. I'm Sally. Even though Claudette and her I'm daughter are reunited Jenny. in the final reel. Yes, darling. Mary Stevens, M.D., is played by Kay Francis, also engaged in what appeared to be unrepentant premarital sex. Swell. The very unmarried doctor tells her nurse... Now, take a good grip on that desk, plant your feet firmly, and prepare for the shock of your life. What? I want to have a baby. Would you mind saying that again slowly? Pleasure. I said, I'm going to have a baby. Less thrilled with her situation is Ruth Chatterton, a remarkable actress whose roles are almost always code breakers. In Frisco Jenny, she was an unwed mother who loses her lover in the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. Desperate to support her child, she turns to prostitution. Maybe the wrong way, but it's going to be my way. Through grit and ingenuity, this mother is soon in charge of her own brothel. Ruth Chatterton was a wonderful friend. I'd seen her on the stage. I found her fascinating and very intelligent and very cosmopolitan. Even such fascinating, intelligent women couldn't halt the coming censorship. They were taking social risks. Real issues were sometimes at stake. And not only unwed motherhood, MGM's Men in White was one of a handful of pre-code films that dealt with the subject of illegal abortion. Better notify her relatives. She hasn't any. And a man who... Does he realize what's happened? I suppose so. Starring Clark Gable and Myrna Loy, Men in White was based on a Pulitzer Prize winning play about the high pressure world of the modern hospital. Scalpel. In the story, an emergency operation must be performed to try to save a student nurse who herself is suffering the result of a back alley abortion. Though honest in its theme, Men in White is restrained in its portrayal. The abortion happens off screen and is never mentioned by name, though it is clearly implied. What happened? Ruptured appendix? More serious than that. Why didn't she come to us? But even this was too much for some critics. The newly formed Catholic Legion of Decency complained of the film, calling it unfit for public exhibition. Thank you, Bethy. Hello, Dr. Braden speaking. In the early 30s, women with advanced college and medical degrees were entering the job market, and pre-code films were eager for their stories. In Dr. Monica, Kay Francis was an MD. After college, Loretta Young took on the world in Big Business Girl. Betty Davis played a confident professional artist in So Big. Katherine Hepburn had her first starring role as the adventurous aviator in Christopher Strong. Which way is the Atlantic Ocean? 
I've been listening to you for over an hour, and all I've heard is a lot of statistics. Ruth Chatterton even took over the boardroom. We're making better motor cars than we ever made when father was alive. And it's your business to sell cars. That's all. In female, she plays an auto magnet. Ruth Chatterton can do it. There is an intelligence there, and there's a force there that is uh, it's very strong, and it's very appealing. I can't go on this way. What are you talking about? I can't stand it any longer. Being near you all day and having you ignore me. I'm a busy woman. I can't be annoyed with jealous or moody men about me. But I love you. That's enough of that. A pedigree. Make arrangements to transfer Mr. Briggs here to our Montreal office. What? That'll be all. Mr. Pettigrew will arrange for your transportation. And from now on, I'll have nothing but women secretaries. Of course. They are rather distracting. One of the most spectacular pre-code women in power was Greta Garbo as Queen Christina. The story of a 17th century bisexual Swedish queen who never marries and abdicates her throne may be suitably complicated, but MGM wasn't so sure it would be great box office. Garbo felt very strongly about making Queen Christina, and what she did was she used that as leverage with MGM who wanted her to re-sign for another contract, and she said, okay, I'll re-sign if we do Queen Christina. Garbo was undoubtedly Metro's biggest moneymaker, and everybody knew it. And uh, Metro was very proud of it. And I expect she was a little bit proud of it, too. The film is full of moments that do not fit most people's idea of traditional family values. Christina dresses like a man and kisses her lady in waiting on the lips. What are you doing up so early? It's Garbo playing a bisexual queen who falls in love with a guy while she's dressed as a man, and then she reveals herself as a woman. Queen Christina is a story of true love that takes place in a lusty atmosphere, as when Garbo, in disguise, is called upon to settle an argument over how many lovers the queen has had in the previous year. And what do you say? I say number nine. Six, indeed. Who's a liar? You're a liar! Nine! And six! Six! Stop fighting! The truth is that the queen has had... Twelve lovers this past year, a round dozen. Long live the queen! The same evening, the disguised Christina is forced to share a bed in the crowded inn with the Spanish envoy, played by Garbo's former real-life lover, John Gilbert, who is both confused and interested by the young man he's been talking to all evening. And they spend three days together in bed. It's, it's very sophisticated stuff. And it's one of the best examinations of sexual identity and one of the most humane films that Hollywood ever made, much less just made in this era. They warmed and ripened in the Spanish sun. My hacienda's overrun with them. Christina is more than a pre-code romp. It's Garbo's most heartfelt statement about love and self-truth. Here she is neither vamp nor love's victim. She is a woman in control who understands the bittersweet fruit of human emotion. What are you doing? I have been memorizing this room. In the future, in my memory, I shall live a great deal in this room. You do the talking, Blondie. I'm not so good at it. Whether you like it or not, there's going to be a big change around here, and it starts tonight. Oh, showdown, eh? You're right, it's a showdown. You've been giving orders long enough. Now you're going to take some. Away from the world of Garbo and Monarchs, America was in the middle of a depression. People were out of work and needed money. That made room for a different sort of complicated woman, the criminal. When the pre-code women turned to crime, your sympathy is always with them, even though they're doing something immoral and unlawful. They're doing it with wit and aplomb, like Barbara Stanwyck in the beginning of Ladies They Talk About. She's really masterminding this bank robbery, and you have to admire her. <laughs> okay. 
it's a kind of turning of the tables. It's a sort of play on, I mean, men do this all the time. That's understood. I mean, why shouldn't women do this? You gotta wait about a half hour, lady. Oh, I can't wait. I have to catch a train at 10 o'clock. Swell. She made it. My maid usually does all my banking for me. Women and crime proved a potent combination. Not infrequently, these women started in the gutter and used any available means to get to the top. Yet we like them. And the audiences always understand that these are not just greedy young girls. These are smart, competent women, stifled by the toughness of the times. Young Barbara Stanwyck was especially memorable in a film called Babyface. Thanks, baby. Sterick and Babyface is pre-code 101. If you want to get somebody to like pre-code movies, you show them Babyface. You hook them, and then you can get them, you know, onto more uh, to other things. Ah, I should have thrown you out years ago instead of raising you the way I did. Yeah, raising me the way you did. It is, uh, you know, it's, it's a completely, wonderfully sleazy movie. Barbara Stanwyck plays a woman who comes from a very bad background, as in the fact that her father is her pimp. Yeah, I'm a tramp, and who's to blame? My father. A swell start you gave me. Nothing but men. Dirty, rotten men. And you're lower than any of them. And uh, she just, you know, sleeps away to the top of an office building and, you know, to a penthouse apartment and a pile of jewels. Say, I'd like to work in there. Can you fix it for me? Say, I like it here. How about a job? Mr. McCoy, those papers will be ready in ten minutes. She's, uh, she's completely cold-blooded, and, and she's a lot of fun. Yes, everything's incorporated in it. Th that's the movie that turns people on to pre-code more than any other movie. Half a million dollars. Someday I'll have the other half that goes with it. Julie Hempel, the size of your bustle. <laughs> it doesn't seem I possible. I worked with Barbara Stanwyck in a film that was called Hemp. So Goodbye, Big. Selena. I had this scene with her. She had lost her husband, and every time she would come to tears, and then the director would have take it over and on, over and over again, and each time she would come to tears, and I said to her, Barbara, I don't understand how you do that. Well, May, she said, it's always the first time. The first time. Well, I just put that away in my mind. Pre-code scripts gave actresses a lot to work with. When Frances D. took the lead in Blood Money, she was happy to find that her director had assigned her a role that was a little more complex than the average criminal. Pagan. Almost savage, isn't it? It's what they call a plum, because it had so many different levels. She was uh, a rather weird character, uh, to say the least. I've got a gun in my pocketbook, and I've hidden those bonds you told me to give Bailey. I have plenty of money. She was a kleptomaniac, a nymphomaniac, and anything in between. I was frankly flattered that he gave me the chance to do the part. I had just finished, I think, Little Women. Quite a departure. Women criminals continued to push the limits as producers got braver. 